Western Canadian pipelines are doomed. Today I'll explain to you my three big reasons why. The Northern Gateway Pipeline to the coast of BC is dead, murdered actually. The Energy East Pipeline from Edmonton to the East Coast is dead too, strangled by regulation. Kinder Morgan Pipeline is on life support right now, the only Canadian export pipeline with the remotest chance of surviving to completion is the Keystone XL Pipeline and that will be thanks in no small part to the push from the American administration to repeal onerous regulation and get energy projects built. But why? Why is it this way? Canada has the third largest oil reserves in the world, just behind Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. We've got a highly trained oil field workforce and extensive safety and environmental standards. So why is it that Canada should be poised to become an energy superpower, but instead we can't even get our products to market? It's embarrassing. I've got three whopping reasons why. The first reason has only made itself clear in the last couple of weeks, and that was only due to an access to information request done by the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Western Canadian oil faces impossible regulations that we know now no other oil has to overcome. An announcement by the federal government put upstream and downstream greenhouse gas emissions considerations on any new energy projects. What that meant was a pipeline company would then be responsible for the greenhouse gas emissions emitted by the end user, like some guy filling up his car and driving around. And now those had to be considered by the federal government before a pipeline could see approval. No other industry is responsible for the end user of the natural resource. Imagine making corn farmers responsible for the diabetes caused by overconsumption of high fructose corn syrup because somebody chose to drink a little too much pop. The new regulations were of course designed to make a pipeline fail. And it did. Energy East was cancelled right after these changes to the regulatory system were announced. The CTF asked the federal government if they had any documents related to the same regulations being applied to foreign oil. And guess what? Those documents don't exist. Saudi oil, Algerian oil, Venezuelan oil, they all get better treatment from Canada's own government than oil from Fort McMurray or Lloydminster, Saskatchewan or Cold Lake, Alberta. But that's not even where the favoritism towards any energy but Alberta's stops. Now it's come to light that Quebec gas projects are escaping the new federal guidelines for upstream and downstream oil and gas emissions. The first project is an aviation fuel terminal in Montreal and the other project is a liquefied natural gas port in Saguenay, Quebec. When reporter Brian Lilly asked the federal government why these two projects got a pass from the government's new emissions test, the government said the new rules only apply to projects initiated after the interim rules were first set out in January 2016. Well, that lame excuse doesn't really hold any water because Energy East was first proposed to the National Energy Board in 2013. TransCanada's main line was proposed in 2014 and Kinder Morgan's Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion first file their facilities application in December 2013. But all of these projects were subject to the new federal government rules. The Quebec projects, on the other hand, are not. They're getting a free ride. The second reason Canadian pipelines are doomed is that as Canadians, we seem to be entertaining foreign-funded, foreign-infiltrated protests as legitimate Canadian opinion on pipeline projects. In this article, halfway through in the Seattle Times, the truth comes out. The article says, Washington tribes, state agencies, and conservation groups have fought the pipeline at every stage because its completion would bring a sevenfold increase in the number of oil tankers traveling through the home waters of killer whales. Let me just restate that because it goes by fast, but it's very important. State agencies, as in the government of Washington, is fighting a Canadian pipeline, Kinder Morgan, that is in the best interests of all of Canada. These groups are calling Kinder Morgan another standing rock, of course referring to the Dakota Access Pipeline protests. And I hope to God it all ends the same way with the protesters going home in bitter defeat. 
None of these groups are protesting oil tankers that are coming down from Alaska through the very same killer whale territory. They're only exclusively targeting Canadian oil from their perches in the United States because it is not about killer whales, although they make for an interesting excuse and it's definitely not about the environment. It's about blocking Canadian oil and gas from getting to international markets. The opposition to Canadian pipelines is fake and fringe and all levels of Canadian government are treating it as legitimate and valid. And the third reason Canadian pipelines are doomed, at least as long as Trudeau and Rachel Notley are in charge, is that social license is not, nor has it ever been, a real thing. Just like the AstroTurf pipeline opposition, social license isn't real. Social, social license basically means conceding your moral and financial high ground to your enemy in order to have them grant you permission to do something they don't really have the authority to grant you permission to do in the first place. Premier Rachel Notley and Justin Trudeau both have been trying to sell Canadians on a carbon tax by saying that it would prompt anti-oil activists and communities to grant permission to build a pipeline. Now the premise is flawed and false from the very beginning. First off, there is no satiating the anti-oil left, so we shouldn't even be bothering to try. And secondly, that's not how a grown-up country works. We have rules and processes in place to grant regulatory approval to a pipeline, and appeasing Greenpeace is just not part of that process. And besides, it's clearly not working. Alberta has a carbon tax. We've had a price on industrial emissions for years. Alberta is currently unwisely phasing out coal-fired electricity. Rachel Notley even appointed lifelong anti-oil activist Sapor Berman and her friend Karen Mahone to the Oil Sands Advisory Group after a lifetime of saying crazy stuff like this here. We need to keep the majority of the carbon that we have left, the majority of the oil, the majority of the coal in the ground. We're not going to be able to avoid runaway climate change unless we keep it in the ground. Notley was trying to appease the anti-oil left by giving them power and legitimacy to try to get them to grant us social license. Or so that's what Notley told us her reasons were. And what kind of social license are we getting from the anti-oil activists in British Columbia? Massive anti-oil pipeline protests, massive violent civil disobedience that has resulted in several cops being injured and dozens of people being arrested, including Rachel Notley's former oil sands advisory group appointee, Karen Mahone. And as for Berman, well, she's now leading the pipeline opposition in British Columbia. Some social license we got there. Now I listed you three reasons, but really it's not three reasons, is it? It's all stemming from one encompassing reason. The left, both here in Canada and abroad, are explicitly anti-oil. In Canada, if you're anti-oil, that also means being anti-Western Canada because, well, to be honest, we make the oil, which means the left, even the left that lives out here in the West, they're pretty self-hating, which means if we ever want to see an energy pipeline done and done fast and done in a way that makes economic sense for everybody, including the pipeline company that employs thousands of people, we got to ditch our left-wing governments. For The Rebel.media, I'm Sheila Gunry. If you want to see some of the other crazy things that Rachel Notley's favorite anti-oil activist, Sapora Berman, has said in the past, go to fireberman.ca.